Welcome to Let the Qur'an Speak. If you ask about the most widely recognized and authoritative religious institutions in the Muslim world, you'll hear the name Al-Azhar come up a lot. Al-Azhar University in Cairo was founded over a thousand years ago, making it one of the oldest universities in the world. Over the centuries, it has produced many of the giants of Islamic scholarship. How did Al-Azhar rise to prominence? What has its impact been on the Muslim world? And what does the future of Al-Azhar University look like? Joining me to explore the legacy of Al-Azhar University is Sheikh Ahmed Saad Al-Azhari. He is the founder and director of the UK-based Ihsan Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies and a graduate of Al-Azhar University. Sheikh Ahmed Saad Al-Azhari, welcome back to Let the Quran Speak. Thank you. So Al-Azhar is widely known around the world as being uh, a leading authority in Islam. And uh, you go by the name Al-Azhari because you studied there and you're obviously proud of, proud of that. Uh, so tell us about what makes Al-Azhar University so prominent. How did it rise, first of all, to its prominence? Um, let me start with a statement that was said by one of the uh, leading figures of Al-Azhar, who actually was the, the, the grand imam of Al-Azhar. Uh, his name is Sheikh Abdul Halim Mahmoud. He said, if people's uh, hajj is not acceptable unless they go to the Kaaba, people's knowledge is not acceptable unless they come to Al-Azhar. <laughs> So, which is uh, quite a big statement, but it has its uh, background. In the beginning of the fourth century after the Hijra, which is the migration of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, which happened around 620 uh, CE. Uh, at the beginning of that century, the Abbasid Khilafah, or the Abbasid Caliphate, um, started to, to dwindle and go through weakness. Actually, it even started a little bit earlier than that. And with the coming of the Mughals and the Tatars who destroyed the Islamic Caliphate in um, the, 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 the Abbasid Caliphate in, in, in what we know nowadays as Iraq, um, there was much need for a center of learning uh, that can protect the, the Islamic, Islamic knowledge and can accommodate students of knowledge and accommodate scholars as well. Um, due to the political scene in the, in the Middle East at that time, uh, the Fatimids who were ruling in what we know nowadays as Morocco, and they were Shia by their, their school of thought, they were Shia, Ismaili Shia, the, the, or what we know as the, the Seveners. Um, they, came to, uh, they came to Egypt to expand their state. So they occupied Egypt, invaded Egypt, took it over. Actually, they took over what we know nowadays as Mecca and al Madina, that side of Saudi Arabia, of the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, Jawhar the Sicilian, the army leader of, uh, of the first uh, uh, leader or ruler of the, of the Fatimid state established the city of Cairo. Mm. Uh, um, it, that's why up to this date it's known as Qahiratul Mu'iz, the Cairo of Al Mu'iz. Al Mu'iz is the, is the name of the first ruler who um, kind of expanded the Fatimid state. They, as uh, it was the tradition in those days, they established a center for learning. Uh, in the, the city, a big mosque, and they named it Al-Azhar, uh, either because this, the area around it was full of zuhur, flowers, or because uh, they claimed that they come from the lineage of Fatima Zahra, the, uh, the daughter of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. So they established that mosque, which is uh, uh, much smaller than the current mosque, actually, mm -hmm. because it has been expanded through generations. And they uh, started a lot of circles for teaching uh, Islamic jurisprudence according to their school of thought and, uh, and other uh, circles of learning in the mosque. When the Fatimid state dwindled, terminated at the hands of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, uh, the mosque which has been seen by Salah al-Din and Salah al-Din himself was a Sunni, which has been seen as a center for uh, Shiism and Shia uh, teaching, um, was closed for a hundred years. And Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi banned uh, any Friday prayers there, any regular pr prayers, any activities in the mosque. But then after a hundred years of establishing his dynasty and, and bringing the country back to Sunnism, because the country was not affected a lot by the Shia school of thought, which was brought by the Fatimids. And this is one of the, of the areas where they failed actually to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to change the, the mentality of the people. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi uh, closed the mosque 100 years later, the mosque was reopened. And this coincided with the fact that there were crusaders, the Muslim world uh, was hit hard by 
a scourge of war by many enemies, the Mughals and the Tatars who came from one side, from the east, uh, the Crusaders who occupied pockets of the Muslim uh, world, uh, Palestine, and they were still having a presence in what we know nowadays as Syria, some even parts of Egypt. So this has led uh, Muslims even in Spain were kicked out and they ended up in Morocco. Muslims from different parts of the world found a safe haven to e in Egypt because it's far from these places. It was seen as one of the good and big civilizations, like one of the prominent cosmopolitan cities. Cairo was seen as a cosmopolitan city at that time. So they came all over. Uh, from all over the Muslim world, they settled in Cairo. People came from Iraq, people came from the Arabian Peninsula, people came from Syria, people came from, uh, from uh, North Africa. They settled in Cairo and they started teaching in Al-Azhar Mosque. At that time, it is as if uh, Allah has predestined for Al-Azhar to play an, a prominent role. Uh, so he brought all scholars from different parts along with students who also came to learn and seek knowledge in Al-Azhar and the country has accommodated them and welcomed them. And they, after, the, uh, after a period of time, they became themselves almost indigenous Egyptians. Mm -hmm. So that's, 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 uh, that's the point that has actually shifted the whole uh, flow of Al-Azhar, the whole history of Al-Azhar from just being an, an ordinary mosque uh, where people just pray five times a day and there is a Friday prayer to becoming one of the most important, if not at, at that point, the most important center of learning in the Muslim world. And that was approximately about 700 years ago? Um, yes, yes, around that. Okay, and so who, what, what happened at that point? Who were some of the main figures and who took Al-Azhar to the next level, can we say? Uh, if we scan some of the names of the scholars at mm -hmm. that time, we realize that many of them were actually not from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Their grand parents and their parents came from somewhere else. For instance, one of the leading scholars of hadith is a, a man called Al-Hafiz Abdul Rahim Al-Iraqi. And Al-Iraqi is originally from uh, Iraq. His great-grandfather came from Iraq and settled in Egypt. He was born in Egypt. And because he grew up in, the, in, in Egypt, uh, started learning in Azhar, teaching in Azhar. And that, uh, that's, he became one of the, of the leading figures of, of hadith. Uh, his student, Al-Hafiz ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, who died around 852 uh, after Hijra, after uh, uh, Prophet's uh, immigration, um, was by far the most notable hadith figure in the, in the, in the past uh, 800, 900 years. Uh, other scholars who traveled from uh, different parts of the Muslim world, like uh, Ibn al-Jazari, who was born in 751 and died 833, Hijri, um, uh, he traveled from uh, Syria or Damascus, the city of Damascus, to Al-Azhar to, to study with the scholars of Al-Azhar. So um, uh, the student uh, of, of Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the great Hadith scholar, Al-Hafiz al-Sakhawi, who died around 903, uh, is another great figure. Uh, Al-Jalal al-Din al-Suyuti, who was uh, another great scholar of Hadith, uh, tafsir, Quran commentary, and uh, and language and a great uh, jurist as well in the Shafi'i Madhab, uh, Shafi'i school of thought. He uh, died around 911. Uh, he was he, he was in, in that uh, living in Egypt. <coughs> so you can say that the 8th, 9th and 11th century were for, for at least 400 years Al-Azhar was leading and taking the lead of Islamic learning because of these great figures that uh, one of, uh, of our teachers uh, mentions that one of his teachers saw in his dream there were some, uh, some works, some uh, construction works in the mosque itself. And because of that, there were, they were digging the floor. There was a lot of dust all, all over the place. So that, uh, that teacher got annoyed by that, by the fact that this uh, dust uh, comes on his clothes and uh, makes them dirty. So he saw in his dream uh, the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, say, saying to him, uh, like, don't be angry, for you don't know how many scholars and righteous people have actually walked on this dust. Mm. So this dust is actually mixed with the feet of people of learning. And as you know, that uh, learning and teaching, circles of learning and teaching, uh, especially sacred knowledge in Islam, are uh, points where angels descend upon the people who attend there, and mercy of Allah covers and encapsulates them. So it's places where uh, God's blessings be, uh, are normally showered upon the people who are participating. So all of this, in bearing all of this in mind, it was as if Allah has placed Al-Azhar in those years to protect Islam and to 
um, and to uh, and to look after it. And that's why they say, uh, had it not been for Al-Azhar at that time, uh, the religion uh, of Islam would have uh, would have been lost. Mm. I want to get a sense of the culture of learning at Al-Azhar prior to uh, the modern uh, period and, and the changes that happened then. What was it like to be a, a student or a scholar at Al-Azhar? Uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, uh, who uh, died in 204 and was born 150 Hijri, um, says that a student of knowledge won't be able to uh, achieve knowledge unless he has dedication. Mm -hmm. We mean by dedication being a full-time student, student of knowledge. And this was at the back of the minds of the Muslim scholars and people who looked after Islamic scholarship from the very beginning. So when they established the schools of learning, the centers of learning, the mosques and other things, they would, uh, which catered for the educational needs and learning needs of the students, they made sure that these students don't need anything outside the school of learning. So when the student comes, his food is catered for, a place for his accommodation, and he has nothing to do from early morning, from dawn time, all the way to uh, uh, Isha or, or even in prayer, except learning. Mm. This tradition was also in Al-Azhar. So Al-Azhar was not only a place for people to come and study and go home, because going home afterwards, uh, nowadays going home, there are so many attractions and distractions at home that will make the student not fully focused on his studies. So in those days, there was this concept of mujawara. Mujawara literally means to be the neighbor of something. Mm. But it was used later on to mean a student who becomes a full-time student by moving from home to become the neighbor of the mosque meaning he lives in the mosque. So in Al-Azhar, even till today, although they are not used anymore, if you go upstairs, there is 120 rooms. Each room can easily accommodate 10 people, at least. So 10 people by 120, that we are talking about uh, a huge amount of, of people. We are talking about more than 1,000 individuals living and sleeping and eating and learning in the mosque. And in each group, between each group of these rooms, there is a hall uh, where the students would, uh, uh, would convene to study and to revise their classes and also to read with their teacher. And it was the system, this actually has developed a very interesting administrative system in, in the mosque itself. So for instance, people who came from a specific area, they were uh, placed and they were, uh, they were put in rooms that are next to each other so that they understand the culture of each other. They will possibly, when they travel back to their homes, uh, if, if some of them are not traveling, are not returning for, for this uh, year, because understanding that means the transportation. In those days were quite difficult, so students would not be frequently going, going home. Mm -hmm. and, and when we say frequ frequently going home, it means once a year, mm -hmm. because the system of studying was starting from uh, the the middle of the month of Shawwal, which we uh, which is uh, the uh, the tenth month in the Hijri calendar, right after Ramadan. So f from the fifteenth of Shawwal, they will continue studying till the fifteenth of Shaaban. So from month ten to the month eight. Mm. So for ten complete months, the students are there every morning from before dawn time. They will start by doing some night prayers. Uh, and then praying their early morning prayer, then doing some awrad or some remembrance of God early in the day, and then doing their classes up till noon time, and then having a siesta, and then starting again till uh, uh, c close to Maghrib or sunset, and then praying, and then going back to class, doing some, some revision, and then right after evening prayer, everyone is in bed to be able to wake up so early in the morning. That was the system for 10 months. In the middle of the month of Sha'ban, right before Ramadan, 15 days before Ramadan, everyone goes to his city or to his town or to his village or travels back home. What do they do in, in, in these 15 days? They prepare people in their own localities to celebrate the month of Ramadan. Mm. People were almost celebrating this newcomer, this returning student, because they, they placed a lot of respect for these students who are learning in the prestigious Al-Azhar. So these students would uh, be in their local mosques, or in their local uh, in their localities or in their local communities, teach them, lead them in taraweeh in the evening prayers of the month of Ramadan, guide them, teach them, spread this culture 
of learning and then celebrate Eid with their families. 15 days after Eid, they will make their way back to Al-Azhar to continue 10 months. Now in, in modern times, uh, obviously Al-Azhar must have faced many challenges as, as, as the entire Muslim world has faced. So can you tell us a little bit about what are some of those challenges and what role does Al-Azhar have to play today? Well, I believe that every uh, organization or institution or even community or even a s civilization that has been persistent for so long goes through times of decline and times of, uh, you can, as they say, you know, like uh, the, 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 the tide of, uh, and, the, and the, the flow of the, of the days. So there is, there is uh, many challenges that are facing Al-Azhar in the modern times as much as many other organizations go through uh, the same challenges. One of these challenges is, um, in, in, in my uh, opinion, is the fact that with the media and with the uh, uprise of many extremist groups who interpret Islam in a different way and have this rigid understanding of Islam, they are challenging the authority of Al-Azhar as much as they are challenging the authority of other centers of learning. Nowadays, we have a problem of authority. Whom do, whom do you listen to? Whom do you follow? Whom do you take your uh, opinion from? Whom, uh, who is a scholar? Even the, even the concept of scholarship has been liquidated so that a, a, a regular person in the street, if you ask him uh, who is a scholar, he wouldn't be able to tell who is a scholar. At those days, there was kind of a very strict, uh, you can say, perspective of a, of a religious scholar that he has to be a graduate of a specific school of learning. Traditionally, we had these schools of learning, whether it's Al-Azhar, whether it's the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, whether it's some centers of learning in, in the Indian subcontinent in, in Mecca and Medina. But nowadays, there is so much knowledge or no knowledge all over the place. So what has happened, uh, the biggest challenge Al-Azhar faces nowadays is people not listening to them. You know, like a father in, his fam in the family. If the father is respected and uh, there is an atmosphere of respect, everyone knows even if the father does, doesn't speak, the children will have this respect for him and they will be valuing his opinion. But once you liquidate the status of the father in the family, then you don't, there is no authority. And nowadays we face this problem at different levels, political level, economic level, even at a family level, and also in uh, religious, uh, religious uh, learning. So with, uh, with satellite channels and many people who are calling themselves the new uh, televangelists, or these, these people of uh, da'wah, uh, we don't know who is a scholar and who is not. We don't know who is a speaker and who is a scholar. So what happens for a, a regular person who is watching the media, he, and he is unable to differentiate between both, he might be challenging an Azhari scholar, saying, you know what, uh, why are you saying this? I have heard something else. So uh, that's one of the biggest challenges that face Al-Azhar at the moment. Another challenge that is facing Al-Azhar at the moment is people thinking or mixing the, uh, the nature of Al-Azhar as an educational institute with uh, the political situation that is running in the country or actually in the Middle East. So they want Al-Azhar to have a political opinion in every, in every area not realizing that Al-Azhar is an education institute that advises, that should be neutral, that should guide people rather than taking sides in, in, in any of, with any of the, of the groups. There's so much more that we could say and look into the fascinating history and legacy of Al-Azhar. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh Ahmed Saad, for joining us. Thank, Thank you today. very much for hosting me.